Okay, the Gospel of John is one of my favourite books in the Bible. Um, and tonight we're looking at a very famous account from John, John chapter number 4, The Woman at the Well. And just to sort of give you a quick sort of summary of what's going on, is, is, is basically in this chapter we see Jesus, he talks with this Samaritan woman, okay, and she gets saved, and so do a bunch of other people. Um, some because she goes and tells them stuff, and some of them, they come and, and see Jesus himself, and they hear Jesus and get saved. So that's, that's basically the quick outline of what happens with the Samaritan woman. But from this, we're going to draw seven different lessons. Seven different lessons from Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. Okay, So it shouldn't be too long. We, it was quite a long service this morning. I'm not quite sure what happened there, but um, it'll be a bit shorter um, this evening. So the first thing we're going to look at is that Jesus initiated the conversation with this woman. Um, if we have a look, well, we'll start in verse number one. Um, verse number one, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptised more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptised not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Now, I'm just mentioning this because we're going to come across it later on. It's worth noting here, did Jesus baptise people, according to this? He didn't, did he? It says, though Jesus himself baptised not, but his disciples. Okay, because previously it talked about um, it talked about Jesus baptizing. Ooh. Yeah, in verse number twenty-two of, cha of chapter three, it says, "After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized." So you get the impression from John three twenty-two that Jesus was baptizing people, but John four verse two makes it clear his disciples were doing the baptizing. So just like John the Baptist was baptizing people. Jesus' disciples were also baptizing people, but Jesus himself wasn't. There's was no one that got baptized by Jesus, okay? And we'll see why this is important as we get through in a wee minute. Okay, so he left Judea, departing into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Look at verse number seven. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. So the first thing I want you to notice is this woman comes to get some water from the well, and Jesus speaks to the woman. So Jesus initiates the conversation with the woman. He's the one who starts it, isn't he? He says something to her. He initiates this conversation. And so the first lesson we can get is that we need to, because in this chapter we're going to see this woman get saved Jesus initiated the conversation if we want to see people get saved we need to initiate the conversation we need to speak to people okay that's what Jesus did he initiated a conversation you see because some people have this idea you might have heard people talk about lifestyle evangelism you've heard people talk about that lifestyle evangelism just the way you live your life that's going to people are going to get saved because of that well there's a problem with that and that's because your lifestyle my lifestyle is not the gospel the gospel, and we don't need to turn there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that the gospel is Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. Faith in him, that's what the gospel is. What does that have to do with my life or your life? Other than maybe we believe that, but I mean, our life, we didn't die on a cross. We didn't get buried, and we didn't get resurrected. Okay, We didn't pay for other people's sins. Our life, we can, be as, we can love our neighbor as much as we want. We can be good people. We can you know, obey what God says to do, but that isn't the gospel. The gospel is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So life, lifestyle of evangelism you know, doesn't really work. Having said that, though, I mean, if you live a really bad life, if you're a scumbag, you know, if you're a drunk, if you're a what, I mean, would that possibly turn people away from hearing the gospel? You know, when you, like, let me tell you about Jesus, you know, and they can smell the alcohol on your breath. Would they really want to listen? No. Okay, so there's a sense in which we can turn people away. But just to be clear, our life is not the gospel. Okay, now, notice that. So Jesus, he takes action. He initiates a conversation. Now, not everyone likes taking action. I mean, some people are maybe naturally shy. They wouldn't tend to naturally do that. But if that's the case, if that's us, we need to change. Okay, we might be, some of us are naturally outgoing. You ever meet people like that and they just talk to people all the time? Just naturally, yeah, my wife's a bit like that. She just naturally, she just chats to people. I remember when the first time I met her, and she was just chitty chat, chitty chat, smiles and talks all the time. Um, I'm more introverted than that. I'm more introverted than that, okay? But the fact is, it doesn't matter if you're outgoing or if you're an introvert. We need to change because we need to initiate the conversation. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, we see Paul talking about this. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 20. 1 Corinthians 9, 20. 
page uh, 1155, 1 Corinthians 9.20 says, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So Paul's concern was to save people. And he said, I'll become like this. I'll become like that. I'll do whatever it takes in order that someone would be saved. That's the attitude we should have. We think we will change. We'll do whatever we need to do in order that some people would be saved. Now, just to note about this. So if you turn back to John 4, about this woman. So this woman, she was a Samaritan woman. Remember, we read it was, it was, um, it says she was, he must needs go through Samaria, then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. So Samaria, there was actually an area called Samaria. There was a city as well called Samaria. There was both. But she's in the area of Samaria, but in a a different different place. And Samaria was the the capital of the northern kingdom. Remember, there there was a division Originally, you had the kingdom was united. You had there was King Saul, then there was King David, then there was King Solomon. But then, in the time of Solomon's son, Solomon's son was uh, uh, Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, in his time, the the kingdom split into two, and you had Rehoboam, and he had two tribes basically, and the other ten tribes were following Jeroboam, and that was in the northern kingdom. So you had the southern kingdom, their their capital was Jerusalem, and you had the northern kingdom that was that was Samaria. Okay. And that's where these Samaritans basically came from. So they were people that they were originally were, were Jewish, but then they were actually the food, because they were a particularly wicked group, they got conquered first. And so they came, I think it might have been the Assyrians or someone came in, and, and basically they got, you know, carted off. And, and one of the things people did in those days, when a foreign invader would come in, in order to conquer people, one of the things they did is they would basically take people captive, take them away to their land, and they'd also take people from their land and bring them, and they would join in there. So people got intermingled. And so what happened was the Samaritans, they were sort of intermingled with, I think it was probably the Assyrians, and so they ended up becoming like half-Jews, if you like. And so the, the, the people in the south, they kind of looked down on them, so they were saying, well, you're not real Jews. You know, it was just like a form, a form of racism, you know, which is, which is a foolish thing, because the Bible says that God has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth doesn't matter what country you come from, doesn't matter what ethnicity you're from, because do you know what we all are? Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, what we are. Because guess what? If you go back, and go back, and go back, every single person in this room is descended from Noah. Did you know that? Every single person. We're obviously all descended from Adam and Eve, if you go back further. We're all descended from Noah. We've all got the same great, 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 whatever, granddad, you know? That's just a fact, okay? And so it's important to understand, we're just from the same family. So there's no, there should never be... The, the idea of racism is, is a foolish thing. It's not a biblical concept. Now, there have been people who would claim to believe the Bible, you know, probably in the south of the United States at times. They'd claim to believe the Bible and use that as an excuse. And you have, like, this is a black church and this is a white church. That's not what it should be like at all, you know. The Bible says that, you know, his, 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 pr- his ha- house is supposed to be, the church is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, for everyone. Okay. So, but this woman, having said that, she is a Samaritan, Okay. And as we look in verse number 9, it says, um, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, that thou being a Jew, ask us drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So he talks to her, and what does she say? Like, what are you talking with me for? I'm a Samaritan, and you're a Jew. You know, why are you talking to me? That this, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, the black people and the white people on the bus, you know, and you're not supposed to sit here, or that sort of, that's exactly what it's like. She said, why are you talking to me? Okay, um, and so, but what does Jesus do? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So notice, Jesus starts by saying, give me to drink. She says, what are you talking to me for? Because I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. And then we see the reason why Jesus talked to her. He says, well, actually, if you knew who I was, you'd actually have asked of me, and I'd have given you living water. And so the point of his conversation was to bring about, he's talking about, and as we're going to see, living water, he's talking about everlasting life, he's talking about salvation. Okay? And so he is telling this woman, as we read through, about everlasting life. So let's have a look and see what he says. Um, the first thing he says, if you'd asked, I would, he would have given thee living water. Verse 11, the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing 
to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence thou hast thou that living water? So notice what Jesus has said. Jesus has said, look, I've, you know, I've asked you to, to, to give me a drink. And she said, why are you talking to me for? And he said, look, if you knew who I was, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. So Jesus initiated the conversation. That's the first point. But the second point is salvation is a gift. Jesus said, if you'd asked me, I would have given it to you. Okay? And the thing about that is there are some people who sort of have the idea that salvation is not a gift. They think it's something you've got to work to get. And there's different levels of what they say you've got to do as far as working. And even one of those things is I've even heard people say, well, but you don't even have to ask for it. Because if you had to ask for it, it wouldn't be a gift. Because asking, well, that's work. But not according to Jesus. Because Jesus said, look, if you'd asked me, um, yeah, if he said to them, give me the drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. So even if you ask, it is still a gift. And I like to use, I like to use the illustration of a gift when I'm talking about the gospel of people. I use the example of a gift. I say, look, if I was going to give you this Bible and you had to pay for it, I said, look, this is going to be 50 bucks for this Bible. Is that a gift? It's not. People understand that. It's not a gift if you've got to pay for it. But also, if you've got to work for it. In fact, talking to, to the um, Terence that we talked to before the service, I said, look, you know, I'll give you this Bible, but if you get to just wash my car for me. <laughs> is that a gift? If you've got to wash someone's car, give it a good clean wax polish, is that a gift? No, because if you've got to work for it, it's not a gift. And the thing about it is, the Bible makes it really clear that salvation is a gift. And if it's a gift, that means it's free. Have a, have a look, if you would, in um, Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. Very familiar verses. Ephesians 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved, page 1179. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that's another word for belief, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So notice that salvation is a gift of God. Being saved, it's a gift of God, and so by definition, it's not of works. Okay, because if it's, you have to work, it's not a gift. But he says, look, clearly, by grace you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It says in um, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So notice, the gift of God is eternal life. So what is eternal life? It's God's gift. So therefore, does it cost anything? No, or it wouldn't be a gift. It's free. It has to be, because he's saying it's the gift. In fact, if you're there in Romans chapter 6, look just back over the page at chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse number 15. Romans chapter 5, verse number 15, says, But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. Notice that. The free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift, and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Did you notice how many times it said the gift? The gift. Or how many times it said three times it said the free gift? The free gift. The free gift. So it's a gift and that means that it's free. Okay, it's important to understand that. There's another verse I, I like to use as well, is in 1 John chapter number 5, 1 John chapter 5, right towards the back of your Bible, 1 John chapter 5, and the thing about it is, 1 John chapter 5, it, it like shows the difference between people who are saved and people who aren't saved. Because there's only two sorts of people in the world. There are people who are saved, that are on their way to heaven, and there are people who are not saved, and they're on their way to hell. Okay, and there's two sorts of people. And it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10, it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And we know the witness back in um, verse number 6. It says, And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. The, the believer has the Holy Spirit living inside them. Okay? So he that believeth, back in verse 10, on the Son of God hath the witness, the Holy Spirit in himself. But then it says, 
He that believeth not God, God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. So you've got the one who believes, and the one who doesn't believe the record. You say, well, what is this record? Verse number 11 tells us. And this is the record. This is the thing that the saved person believes, that the unsaved person does not believe. Verse 11 says, and this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. So we understand the person who's saved, they understand that eternal life is where? It's in Jesus. It's nowhere else. It's not in Muhammad, it's not in Buddha, it's not in any other false religion. It's only in Jesus. But also, it says God has given to us. He's given it to us. And so, if he's given it to us, it's a gift. That's what it's saying. He's given it to us. If someone thinks, oh, you've got to work to get it, you've got to pay to get it, do they believe it's a gift? Do you have to pay for a gift? Do you have to work for a gift? No, you don't. So if someone says, you've got to work, yeah, I'm working. I'm trying to get to heaven. I'm working. They don't believe this. They're not on their way to heaven. Okay? Um, and obviously the fact that it's eternal life, and we'll look about that a, a, a wee bit more in a wee second. So that's a key thing we need to understand. It's, it's about receiving a gift, and a gift is free. But not only is it receiving a gift, receiving the gift of salvation actually involves receiving a person. Turn back to John, and look in John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. In verse number 12, you see, receiving eternal life is actually receiving a person. It's receiving the person of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is eternal life. The Bible says this is the true God and eternal life. Um, John chapter number 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, talking about Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So to be saved, you've got to believe. You've got to receive Jesus Christ. You've got to put your faith in him. And obviously part of that involves knowing who Jesus is. Not that he's just some sort of good prophet. He's not some good teacher, although he was a good teacher. But he's God. He's God in the flesh. First Timothy 3.16, without controversy, greatest mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. Um, turn back to um, chapter number 4. Chapter number 4, and we'll see that the woman, she didn't understand that. He said, look, if, if you, he said, give me to drink. Thou wouldst have asked of him, he would have given thee living water. Verse 11, the woman saith to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? So what does she, she think? She, she doesn't really understand it, does it? She, she, she thinks he's sort of talking about water. Look at that, um, verse number 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank of himself, and his children, and his cattle? So she's standing there talking to Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, and she says, are you greater than Jacob our father? Well, was Jesus greater than Jacob their father? He was, wasn't he? But did she know that? She didn't. She didn't, she didn't understand what he was saying. She didn't understand who he was, okay? Um, which is something we need to understand to be saved. So the first thing, we see Jesus, he initiated the conversation. We see he talks about salvation as a gift. But now look at the third thing. Look at verse number 13. What does Jesus say? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So notice, the third point, Jesus initiated the conversation, salvation is a gift, but also it's talking about everlasting life. Everlasting life. He says, look, whosoever drink of this water that I shall give him will never thirst. In other words, you drink it once, and you never get thirsty again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm often, in fact, I had a drink just before. I'll have another one now. I get thirsty. But imagine if you had one drink, and you were never thirsty ever again. Forever. That's, that's, the, that's what Jesus is talking about. Eternal life, everlasting life. You drink it once, and it lasts forever. That's exactly what it is. It's everlasting life. And the thing about that is, the salvation that Jesus offers, you can compare that to the salvation that false religion offers. You see, false religion offers a different type of salvation. Obviously, it's not a real salvation. But what they'll say is, you've got to do works. Well, how many good works do you have to do? How, how, do you have to keep on doing them? Yeah, you do. Because they, well, if you stop doing it, you know, if you stop coming to this church, or if you, if you stop doing whatever, whatever rules and regulations we lay down, if you don't do those works, um, that's different from this. Working and working and working and working to be saved, as opposed to you just do it once, and it lasts forever. You know? I mean, the thing about eternal life is eternal life is something, 
It lasts forever. It means it cannot be lost. It cannot be lost. Okay? Um, in Matthew chapter number 7, verse 23, Jesus said, when Jesus said, depart from me, remember how he said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. When he says, look, he's, he's, he's going to say to some people, depart from me, and he also says, I never knew you. Well, what does that mean? See, some people who don't believe in everlasting life, they think, well, I could be saved today, but then not saved tomorrow. That's not everlasting life, is it? Because if I had it today and it lasted for a day, it's gone. That's not everlasting life. Okay? Um, <coughs> but you could, if you were saved, and then a day later, or a week later, or a year later, you weren't. Could Jesus say, I never knew you? If you were saved, and then you weren't? No. Obviously not. Okay? And so the point about that is, the Bible teaches the concept of everlasting life. The Bible says when we get saved, we get sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians chapter 1 Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, In whom you also trusted, trusted in the word for believe, after that you heard the word of truth. That's how people get saved. Faith cometh by hearing. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, and after you believed, were trusted, got saved, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when someone gets saved, God gives them the witness of the Holy Spirit. They're sealed. It's like a mark. It's like a stamp that's put upon them. This is mine, says God. Okay? Um, look at chapter number 4. Chapter number 4 of Ephesians. Chapter number 4 and verse number 30. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So this is, you know, Paul, he's talking to believers, saying don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God who's dwelling in you. Why? Because you're sealed until the day of redemption. And that's talking about the day of redemption. And redemption is another word for being saved, but that's referring to the redemption of your body. Because we're saved spiritually, but our bodies are still the same. We've still got the same bodies that we had before we got saved. It's not until Christ comes back we'll get a new body. Okay, that's what that's talking about. But in, until then, you're sealed. You've got the Holy Spirit. Um, and, I mean, Jesus, he used lots of illustrations talking about this. He talked about the, the concept in John 3 of being born again. He says he talked about being a child of God. Well, we know, I mean, how long... You know, some of you have got children. How long will those children be your children for? Forever. They'll always be your children. Is there anything they could do to not be your children? If they're really bad? Obviously not. They'll always be your children. Okay? Well, it's the same thing. Once you're a child of God, you're always God's child. There's nothing you could do to not be God's child. Okay? That's, that's an important thing. So look, look back at John 4, verse 15. John 4, verse 15. Because she actually starts to grasp the, the eternal bit. But, verse 15, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So she realises, hey, if I'm going to get this, I won't have to be coming back. But she's still thinking about physical water, isn't she? She's saying, I'm not going to have to come back to the well and get water from here. So she, she's getting the eternal part, but she's thinking about physical water. Look at verse number 16. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast has well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidst thou truly. The woman saith to him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So notice here, Jesus says, Look, <coughs> don't call your husband. She says, Well, I don't have a husband. He says, You're right there. Actually, you've had, how many was it? Five husbands, and the person you've got at the minute. He's not your husband. So she's had five husbands and she's living with someone at the minute who's not her husband. And so she's kind of realising, hey, this guy's a prophet. He knows some stuff about me. Now, some people do use this passage of scripture to say, look, Jesus had to deal with her sin. Do you notice here anywhere this woman falling down on her knees and saying, I'm sorry for having all these failed marriages. I'm sorry for living in sin. Do we see her doing that? We don't. Now, should we... You know, should we get divorced? No, the Bible says God hates divorce. Should we live in sin, live in fornication? No, God hates that. It's a wicked sin. But the fact is, that has got nothing to do with who getting saved. Okay? Because if you've got to turn away from the sin of living in fornication, for example, to get saved, what other sins would you have to turn away from? How about the sin of lying? Never going to lie again, ever. Not even once. What about the sin of being lazy? Never ever going to be lazy. Never even once. What about the sin of thinking a foolish thought? 
Because the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. You ever had a foolish thought? Don't you have foolish thoughts pretty much every day? Yep, well guess what? You know, So it, it's, it's a silly thing to say. Um, the, point, the purpose of it was that she would realise, hey, this guy's a prophet. How does he know that? How does he know about all my husbands? How does he know about this? I've never met this guy. He's some Jewish guy from somewhere else. How does he know this? Why? Because he's a prophet. And that's what she says. I perceive that thou art a prophet. But then look at verse 20. And then she goes on and says, look, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she starts talking about something completely different. She starts going off on a tangent. And you'll find that sometimes, if you're outside, if you're preaching the gospel to people, sometimes people talk about strange things. They'll talk about aliens and all sorts of things. And it's like, we need to get back. We need to focus on the message, not, not get distracted. Um, so look what Jesus says, verse number 21. He says, look, Jesus said unto a woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is, the, is of the Jews. So Jesus says, look, actually, you don't know what you're talking about. Salvation is of the Jews, and that basically that's talking about when it's referring to knowing versus not knowing. She says, look, you don't really know what you're talking about. Salvation is coming from the Jews, and that kind of can um, be referenced to um, R- R- Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 1. Romans 3, 1 says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Verse 2, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. What's the advantage that the Jews had? What was the advantage of being a Jew? They had the Bible. Unto them were committed the oracles of God. That's, that's, the, that's the big advantage that they had. They had the advantage of God's word. Okay? Back in John 4, verse 23, that the hour cometh, and, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's stressing the importance of the truth. The importance of the truth. And we understand, when it comes to being saved, we need God's truth. We need God's truth. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says, sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. You know, John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, over and over again, it's important. It's God's word. That's what people need in order to be saved. They need God's word. The Bible says, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. You know, being born again, it says, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we need God's word. We need God's truth. Look at verse number 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So she knows Christ is coming. Jesus tells her, I'm he, she believes. And she goes back and says, look, hey, look, I found this guy. He told me everything I did. Isn't this the Christ? She's believing and she's telling those people. Okay, she tells them. And then others, those people, they end up coming to Jesus. And this, in this chapter we see here, this is actually a great picture of soul winning. Okay? Because what does, she hears this message, she believes it, she gets saved, and then she also goes and tells others. So we've seen so far, we've seen that Jesus initiated the conversation. We see that it was a free gift that he was talking about. And we can see it's everlasting life. But then, the fourth point, and this is something I've only just noticed just recently, is that obviously this woman, you know, she believes. So she's saved. She goes and tells others. And we'll see in a second that some of them also believed. Um, and then some of them then came and talked to Jesus and then they believed. So it pictures this woman was, was a soul winner. Right from the, from the time she got saved. <coughs> but of course, we normally think of, don't we normally think of, and we've had some baptisms re- recently, don't we often think of, you know, think of the Great Commission. You know, go therefore and teach all nations, teach them the gospel, they get saved, baptising them, they the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. So you've got being saved, then you've got getting baptised, and then you've got obeying all the other commands, which would include preaching the gospel. But here... This woman goes soul winning. When did she get baptised? Did she get baptised? I didn't see it. 
In fact, it can't be the case because isn't the only person there Jesus? And didn't we read at the start of the chapter, Jesus himself baptised not, but his disciples. So his disciples did the baptising, not Jesus. So it's not as though, okay, well maybe after she got saved, he, just, he quickly baptised, off she went. Before they... That's not what happened, because the Bible says Jesus didn't baptise. So clearly this woman, even though she hasn't been baptised, what has she done? She's gone off and told other people. She's gone off and told other people, said, look, come and see a man, which told me all things that ever I did, okay? <coughs> now we know from the scripture that being baptised, that's something that must happen after salvation. Okay? Can't happen before. Acts chapter 8. You know, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch going through the desert. says, here's, you know, gets the gospel preached to him. says, here is water. What doth him to be baptised? Philip says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And so he believes, he gets baptised. So it's really clear. You've got to be saved first, then you can get baptised. Well, Clearly, she was saved because she believed, but she hadn't got baptised. His disciples weren't there. Okay, so, so when she went and told these people about Jesus, she was not baptised at that point. Now, we should obey everything that Jesus tells us to do. Everything that the Bible tells us to do. Okay, and it's fantastic. Some of you guys have got baptised recently. That's fantastic. But it's important we understand, we should never let disobedience in one area keep you back from obeying in another area. Okay? Some people sometimes have it like an all or nothing attitude. You th they think, well, it's, it's either all or nothing. In other words, if, if I've messed up here, oh, well, that's it, just flat. It's all or nothing. You ever, ever had that sort, of, that sort of attitude? Well, that's not what we see in the Bible. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 16, a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. In other words, you messed up, but you just get up. You messed up, but you get up. Because Satan wants the opposite. Satan wants to say, look, you've messed up. Don't bother trying. Give up. You know, that's what he, he's the accuser of the brethren. Satan will point out what you've done wrong and say, there's no point. You can't do anything. You can't serve God. That's, what he, that's who he wants to say. He wants to discourage you and prevent you from doing things that God wants you to do. Okay? Um, look, actually, look in, um, further on this chapter. Look at verse number 39. Um, just skip ahead. Um, so, because she goes to tell them, that's what we said, it says um, in verse number... Uh, Oh yeah, so back in verse 28, the woman left her water pot, went away into the city, and sat the men, come see a man which told me all things ever I did, is not this the Christ? And they went out of the city and came unto him. Um, verse number 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified he told me all that ever I did. So this woman told them, and what did they do? They believed. So she got saved, they got saved too. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him, this is Jesus, that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. So notice what we're seeing here. Many believe because of what the woman said. She was soul winning on the same day that she got saved. But also did you notice that many came to hear Jesus himself, and then they believed. So we see both. So the, 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 the woman got people saved, but she also brought people to hear more. And we should aim to do the same thing in our lives. We should bring people to hear from Jesus. In fact, we see this before. If you look back in John chapter number 1, this is a sort of a common thing. John chapter number 1, verse number 40. John chapter number 1, and verse number um, 40. <clears throat> Oh, actually, we'll go back to verse number 37. Um, <coughs> it says, And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto him, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's Peter. So it was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. So how did Peter come to Jesus? According to this, it was um, Andrew, his brother, said, Come, come to Jesus. Come here, come and see Jesus. Have a look in verse number, um, it's verse 45, I think it is. Um, then Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he comes and tells, um, he comes and tells Nathaniel. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? 
Philip saith unto him, come and see. So notice what they do. So I say, look, come and see. Come and see. Just the same thing. That's exactly the same thing that this woman did. She said the same thing. You see, it's important that we understand that this woman was a soul winner right from the start. But was she necessarily the greatest of soul winners? Not necessarily. But she told people and they believed because you don't have to be, it's not that you have to reach some great standard. Okay? All you need to do is, because the thing that saves people is God's word. You just show them a few scriptures and they believe to be saved. Okay? Now we can learn. It's a good thing to learn. It's a good thing to train. The Bible says, you know, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks if you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We should, so that we know how to answer people. But the fact is, we should just start doing it just like this was woman, straight away. Straight away. Okay? Um, and so what, what this is actually like, I mean, we talked a bit about in the sermon this morning about the idea of bearing fruit. Bearing fruit, and we saw the false prophets, how they bear fruit. The fruit that they bear is evil fruit, is corrupt fruit. Okay? But the, the Christian should, should bear you know, good fruit, and that's talking about people getting saved. It says in Proverbs 11.30, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Okay, That's the fruit that we should be bearing. Mm -hmm. We should be telling people about Jesus, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. using the Bible, because that's how they're going to get saved. Okay, so soul winning, we see this woman soul winning even though she wasn't baptized, right from the word go. Now the fifth point is that um, the gospel, from what, what we're seeing here, the gospel is for everyone. Because remember, where was this woman from? She was a Samaritan. So she's like, she's like a foreigner. I mean, certainly the Jews didn't regard her as, you know. And, and, and she had all these past sins. She was, she'd been married five times. She'd been married five times and was living in sin. Does that kind of look like someone that God's going to use? Doesn't really. She was a woman. I mean, wasn't the men were sort of held in high esteem, whereas the woman, weren't they sort of, you know, I mean, their, their testimony back at this time wasn't even thought to, you know, if, if a woman says something, that's not, that's not of any merit. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I mean, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is not going looking for perfect people. Because if he was, well, we'd all be out of luck. Okay? Um, <coughs> yeah. But not only is the gospel for everyone, so is preaching the gospel. That's for everyone too. Look at Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 17. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 17. Acts 2, 17. Acts 2, 17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So notice that. It's for young and old. It's for men, and it's for women. You know, Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 3. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 3. Some people say, oh, well, you're one of these churches, you don't believe that women should be standing behind the pulpit preaching. Yes, that's right, because the Bible says that. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to use her authority over men, but to be in silence. It says, you let your woman keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. I'm just quoting the Bible. I don't make that up. That's just quotes from the Bible, okay? And I believe that. But, look at Philippians 4, verse 3. He says, and I entreat thee also, page 1186, I entreat thee also, I'm like urging you, pleading with you, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which laboured with me in the gospel with Clement also, and with other my fellow labourers whose names are in the book of life. So he said, look, help these women who did what? Laboured. They worked with me in the gospel. So there were women who worked with Paul in the gospel. Now, were they standing up preaching in the church? No, they weren't. But were they going out and preaching the gospel to people? Absolutely they were. They were preaching the gospel to people. Okay? And um, there's many examples of that. Where Because the thing about it is, we have been given a... Commission. We've been given the Great Commission. The Bible says we, we are ambassadors, I think it says. In, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, it says we are ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, and verse number, <coughs> verse number 18 says, In all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, page 1167, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He's given us the word, the word by which people can be reconciled. He's given it to us. He says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in God's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So we're ambassadors. An ambassador speaks on someone else's behalf. Just like Andrew spoke on Jesus' behalf to Peter and said, yeah, come and see him. Just like this woman spoke to the people in her town on Jesus' behalf. And said, look, isn't this the Christ? Some of them believed. And some said, okay, well, we'll come and see ourselves. She was an ambassador. Right from the word go, we should be ambassadors. That's what God's given us to do. That's what he wants us to do. Okay, turn back to John chapter number, John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4 and verse number 34. Look at this. John chapter 4, verse 34. Um, John chapter 4, verse number 34. Jesus saith, saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. So notice this. Jesus was focused on working. Wasn't he? He was working. I mean, remember the disciples, they'd gone back to get food, hadn't they? Jesus was working. He was doing what the Father wanted him to do. You see, many churches will say that their purpose is to glorify God. You've heard them talk about that? Yeah, we want to glorify God. We want to glorify God. Well, that's great, but what does the Bible say? John chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So if you want to glorify God, do the work that God tells you to do. Okay? Well, what's the work that we've been given to do? Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You can't, I mean, often churches will say they've got a focus on world evangelism. You ever them talk about that? You know, we, we're going to ev- you know, go out and evangelize. We're going to send a missionary over here. We're going to send a missionary over there. But is that really the focus they have? I mean, if a church doesn't preach the gospel here where they are, is it really going to do it over in Africa or over in some other foreign country somewhere? I mean, it sounds nice. I mean, we'll raise some money and we'll go and go on some, you know, we might see some alliance or something over there or maybe we'll, maybe we'll do some good work. We'll, we'll build a hospital or, you know, do some farming or stuff like that. But that's not the work that we were given to do. Okay? That's the work that we were given to was go and preach the gospel. Okay? And the Bible actually says, look, if someone who's faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. In other words, if you're not going to preach the gospel right here and now to the people in Dunedin, are you going to go somewhere else and preach it? Go to some foreign country and preach it? Are you going to do it there if you won't do it here? You won't. You've got to do it here. Do it here, and then you will do it there. You know, I mean, the, the, the missionary that we support, and he's doing great work over in the Philippines, guess what? He preached the gospel. He was a great soul winner back in the States. He was a great soul winner over there. He was a very thorough, and he worked very hard, and then he goes to the Philippines, and he does the same thing. Okay? Whereas, I mean, I know other people, I mean, there's a guy, I'm constantly getting emails from this guy all the time, he's, he's, he's raising money, what's he going to start a church in Japan? I'm not quite sure why, because he, he's married, he's, he's, now he's giving, they don't think they've got any kids yet, they, they've got a child on the way. Um, but he's going around the states, they call it deputation, they go around all these churches and preach to them and say, give me money, give me money, support me, until, until they've got enough churches offering them money to pay a salary, then they'll go and start a church. Wouldn't it be much easier... If he just went, him and his wife went to Japan and started preaching the gospel to people. He could have a job. He could have a job, work, pay for his, support his family, and preach the gospel. And he wouldn't have to, you know, those people could use their money for something else. Okay? That would be much better. That would be a much better idea. Anyway, sorry, that's just off, off track. So, that was the, the fifth point, that the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. And then the, the sixth point, that was just verse 34, look at verse 35. <coughs> He says, Say ye not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto him life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. See, the fields are white unto harvest. This is one of our verses we use here. This is from um, Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. And he says, look, and, and, sorry, verse 38. And verse 37 he says, look, the harvest truly is plenteous. But the labourers are few. And then he says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, there will send forth labourers into his harvest. Workers into his harvest. He's saying, and that's exactly what Jesus said, look, lift up your eyes and look, the fields are white, they're ready to harvest. He's saying, there's a harvest out there. There's people ready to hear the gospel, 
But there's not many labourers. There's not many labourers. You know, me and Doug were out before church preaching the gospel. The, we didn't see a lot of other people all over the place. The labourers are few. We need more labourers. We need more people to say, yeah, here am I, Lord, send me. I'll go. I won't go. Don't have to go far. Just go across the street. Just go across the street and knock on someone's door. Okay? Jesus, God in the flesh, he tells us the fields are white unto harvest. He's saying the harvest is ready. And do you know what else he's, he's saying? He's saying get to work. It's ready. Get to work. Okay, some people, sometimes people wonder, they, I've had people ask before, well, how come your church is, you know, it's not the biggest church around? Yeah, we're a relatively new church, we've only been around for just over a year. But one of the reasons why we're not the biggest of churches is because we are a church that's in favour of working. And lazy people don't like coming to this church because when I preach, I'll preach, do some work. Now, we never make you do work. We, I won't put a Bible in your hand and shove you out the door and say, go and preach the gospel. But I'll encourage you. But if you want to be lazy, it's like, well, I'd rather go somewhere else where no one's, no one's going to tell me that. They'll just say, oh, you have, God loves you, have a good day, have a cup of tea, and you go home. That's, that's, just, that's, just, that's just the truth. And, and you think, oh, you're making this up. Well, no, look, look at Matthew chapter number 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse number 1. Matthew chapter number 20, verse number 1. Matthew 21 says, for the kingdom of heaven, page 984, for the kingdom of heaven, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, is like unto a man that is a householder which went out early in the morning to hire labourers into his vineyard. What's the kingdom of heaven like? It's like a guy who's hired workers. So God's hired us as workers. And when he had agreed with the labourers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go you also to the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle. And said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? This is a picture of God saying, Why are you doing nothing? Why are you idle? Why aren't you labouring? Okay? There's so, much we, there's so much we can do. We can preach the gospel. I mean, there's, there's other things also. I mean, we can, we can bring people to hear the gospel preached. I mean, I think there's someone in this room that someone brought someone in this room, and that's how she heard the gospel. Isn't that right? That's what happened. She brought a friend, and that friend heard the gospel, and that's how she got saved. Isn't that just like this woman? Isn't that just like saying, come? And I'm, saying, I'm not saying, I'm not Jesus. But I'm just, I'm preach, I preach the gospel to people. And it's the same thing with, like with Doreen. I mean, Doreen got saved last Sunday night. She got saved last Sunday night. And the thing about it is, who saved Doreen? Obviously Jesus, didn't he? Jesus saved Doreen. But did you know the Bible refers to us? I mean, doesn't, doesn't Paul say that I, by, by all means, might save some? Paul said he saved people. You know? The Bible talks about us saved. Why? Because we are actually labourers together. We are actually labourers together with God. That's what it is. It says um, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says we are labourers together with God. We're working with God to save people. You see, Doreen came, Jesus saved her, but I preached the gospel. I preached the gospel to Doreen so that she'd be saved. I was working with God. But did you know it wasn't just me? It wasn't just me. You see, Doreen has a husband. Doreen has a husband who's overseas in Singapore. And he found us on the internet. And he told Doreen to come to this church. He said, you need to go to that church. And so she came here and, preached the, and I preached the gospel and she got saved. Doesn't that mean that her husband had a part in her getting saved? I'm pretty sure he would be back in, the, in Singapore praying for his wife. Yep. Guarantee it. Mm. Okay? Mm. But I mean, who got, who, got, who got him saved? Well, that person had a part in it as well. And so what you see, there's a work to do and we're all working in it together. We're all working in it together. So there's a lot of things we can do. And there's lots of different things that we can do. We can bring people to hear the gospel. We can preach the gospel ourselves. We, can, I mean, we have these, um, these everlasting life cards. You can give these to people. On these, on these cards, there's like a, a web address or they can scan in their phone. And if they go there, there's like a video on YouTube and it goes through just preaching the gospel. It's just a bunch of Bible verses. They're simple as that. Simple as that. Um, what about this? It doesn't look like they said the sin is correct in that sense. Well, the, the, thing, the thing you need to understand that the Bible doesn't mention a thing called a, this, a sinner's prayer Like you can't turn to chapter number that says the sinner's prayer because when people got saved in the Bible they said all sorts of things I mean the, the thief on the cross said Lord remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom you know the, the, they talked about the, the, was it the, the Pharisee and the, the, was it the tax collector and he, you know, and, he, and, he, and he said Lord have mercy on me a sinner 
You know, it's not the particular words that you say, okay? And so the, the, the concept of saying particular words. Now, I do, I use a sinner's prayer. And the reason I do that is because I want to make sure that the person believes these things. And so, so I preach those things, and I get them to pray those things. Understand, it's not magic words. Words don't save you. What do you have to do? You have to believe, okay? So it's just saying, Lord, please save me. That's fine. But the Bible does talk about it. In fact, we sang it before. Romans 10, mm -hmm. for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Mm -hmm. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mm -hmm. So it's not that there's a set formula you have to say, mm -hmm. but the fact is, the Bible says, I believe, therefore I've spoken. Mm -hmm. You know, I will take the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Okay, so the concept is there. Okay, yeah, I'm not into just mindlessly praying prayers with people. And there are people who do that. They'll run around, one, two, three, repeat after me. Repeat this prayer, repeat this prayer. But what, what does that person believe? You know? You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, that's another... I, I don't want to go off and preach a different sermon. Okay, so last thing we want to talk about. The, so the harvest is plenteous. God, you know, he's looking for labourers. And the fact is also that he's going to reward us. Isn't that what it says here, verse number 36? And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So you say, look, there's a reward. You will actually get, I mean, you're receiving wages. You're receiving wages. So this is not talking about salvation, is it? But this is talking about you being paid. You see, God's going to reward us according to our labour. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 27. Matthew chapter 16, and verse number 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. That's not talking about salvation. That's talking about the fact he saved people according to what they do, God's going to reward you. Now some people are get rewarded a lot. And some people, they're not going to get very much. That's just a fact. I mean, um, uh, look at, uh, was it First Corinthians um, chapter 3? <coughs> excuse me. First Corinthians chapter number 3. <coughs> Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11. <clears throat> it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work, or test every man's work, of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he will receive a reward. So if what you've done working for God tries the fire, you're going to get rewarded for what you've done. If any man's work shall be burned, but didn't survive the fire, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, it sells by fire. So notice this has got nothing to do with your salvation. Okay? And that's why it uses the, the whole, you've got wood, hay, stubble, that burns up. But then you've got, you know, precious stones and stuff, which the fire, I mean, you use it, fire would purify gold and silver and stuff, okay? And so God is going to reward us. I mean, it's right through the, I mean, the last book of the Bible, Revelation twenty two twelve says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. God's going to reward us, what? According to our works. Now, he doesn't save us according to our works. We're saved by grace through faith, by believing you don't have to do anything to be saved. You never have to come, never have to, come to church at all, any, anymore. You never, didn't have to come in the first place. You didn't have to get baptised. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to, all of these commands, to be saved. But if you want to please God, what do you have to do? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And guess what? If we love God, that's what we should be doing. And he'll reward us if we do that. You see, I mean, do you think this woman is going to get a big reward? Yeah, I think she is. We saw these people getting saved. You know, was her life perfect? No. But God can still use us even in spite of that. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's just like a, like a clay pot. Like an, earth, you know, an earthen vessel. Just, you know, does that look really flash? Not really. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. When you look at someone, you think, well, yeah, that person, there's nothing really special about them. But what's that showing? It's like, it's not about them. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God. And God can use you. Okay? So, in conclusion, we've seen Jesus, remember he initiated things. He started. He went and started the conversation. 
We saw salvation was a free gift. We saw that last river. We saw this woman leading others to Christ even when she wasn't baptised. You know, preaching the gospel source for everyone. The Samaritan woman who'd been married multiple times and living in sin, she went and preached the gospel. Didn't she? Um, and we saw the harvest is plenteous. My question is, will you join in the work? The harvest is plenteous. I mean, pray the Lord of the harvest you will send forth labourers into his harvest. How about this? Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would make us labourers. That would be a great prayer, wouldn't it? And the fact is, we're going to be rewarded for our work. We're going to be rewarded for our work. Not with salvation, because that's a different gospel. That's a false gospel. But the fact is, if you're saved, then God's going to reward you. And some people go, oh, well, you know, should we be motivated by rewards? Isn't that kind of greedy? Isn't it sort of, you know, that's a bad sort of thing? But who's the person who's offering the rewards? I mean, isn't God? I mean, well, how insulting would it be to God? He's offering a reward for something, and you turn up your nose. You, you have this sort of this holier than thou attitude. Well, I'm not motivated by that. I'm too holy for that. And really? I mean, do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to, do you want to, he talks about preparing a mansion for us, doesn't it? And is everyone going to be the same in heaven? Is heaven sort of like communism? We're all exactly the same? Or are there going to be people, aren't, doesn't the Bible say people ruling over 10 cities? Mm. They talk about people who, they don't have much. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay? A reward is valuable. Okay? And what, we should value what God values. We should value what God values. Okay? And so, that's my encouragement to use the example of this woman at the well and decide that we're going to be working to do God's work. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. When you do work, everything you've done, thinking, I'm going to bring this person so they can hear the gospel to be saved. I'm going to give someone something. You know, I'm going to give them this so they can, they can go and, and, and find out about it. I'll share this with them. You know, and understand... <coughs> With these things, I'm not saying, okay, just do that, because there are churches that you just dish out these. The best thing is if you actually preach the gospel to someone. Mm -hmm. That's the best, isn't it? That's the best. Mm -hmm. Okay? But the fact is, we can use, and God will use all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. He will use all sorts, but just it's like, we should have the attitude, here am I, Lord, send me. That's, that's what we see in this woman, the woman of the well. We can learn a lot from the woman of the well. And in fact, as I was doing this, I just, in fact, so I didn't even think until tonight, I realised that we've got women right here in this room. It's like the woman at the well. Yes. They've brought people. Yes. People have been saved because of their actions. And that's, that's a fantastic thing. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us to learn from the example of this woman. She wasn't perfect, and we're not perfect. She didn't have to turn from her sin to be saved, and neither do we. But she did believe. And we believe. Lord, please help us to be used. Help us to labour. Help us to work hard for you. Help us to, to find people that we can preach the gospel to, that we can, that we can bring to hear the gospel, that we can, we can do something for, Lord, that's going to have eternal value. Lord, we thank you for the free gift <coughs> of salvation. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.